So in a previous lesson, uh, we looked at a collection of objections to frequentist inference and hypothesis testing related to misuse. So for example, p-hacking uh, and researcher degrees of freedom, multiple comparisons, these were objections not necessarily uh, to frequentist inference itself and, the, and its underlying logic, but objections to the way that it is easily misused. And I think uh, proponents of these kinds of objections will say something like, maybe frequentist inference is on sound footing. Uh, it has proper justifications, but the justifications are so um, convoluted and the methods are so convoluted that they're so easily misused. And for that reason, uh, they're problematic and we should look for alternative methods. Uh, you know, one of the examples was p-hacking. It's quite easy to get a smaller p-value by removing data points or adding data points, um, uh, claiming that something is an outlier, or just kind of manipulating your data set in ways that would give you the result that you want, uh, even though that's a violation of the logic of frequentist inference, which suggests you should start out with a fixed sample size, for example. So there's a really cool demonstration of p-hacking and researcher degrees of freedom on the 538 blog. And um, the link for that blog is here uh, at the top of the slide. And I think it'd be interesting to kind of work through this activity um, where we find uh, some significant results by manipulating some variables on this 538 website. So here's the website. It's called Hack Your Way to Scientific Glory. And it was created by statisticians at 538 uh, to kind of demonstrate some of the issues with using p-values as kind of the sole metric for uh, finding a scientific result. The example here is in the social sciences and kind of uh, political science, but I think these, uh, th this kind of lesson extends well beyond just the social sciences. So, uh, you know, the idea here is that maybe you're a social scientist and you're looking to learn about the relationship between the U.S. economy and whether Republicans or Democrats are in office. And that's kind of your research question. Um, one of the really tricky things in any statistical paradigm, any data analysis, is to figure out how to operationalize your variables which means how do you actually measure this concept that is important to you or important to society? So to know how the U.S. economy is impacted by Republicans and Democrats being in office, you have to know first how to measure the U.S. economy, how it's doing, what's a good metric for the economy or set of metrics. And you also have to uh, define a way of measuring what it means for a Republican or Democrat to be in office, right? There's no time in history where only Republicans will be in every office from local to the presidency. Uh, and so, you know, you have to figure out what does it mean for one of these to be in office? And so this little interactive website uh, gives various ways of measuring both of these variables. So um, first, you know, you have to choose a party. You might choose Republicans or Democrats. I have Democrats here uh, filled out for number one. And then for number two, define our terms. So this is what I mean by operationalizing our variables. How are we to measure uh, what it means for a Democrat to be in office? Well, the configuration that I have right now uh, is defining Democrats being in office by a House of Representatives. So I just have that House of Representatives box checked. Um, and my uh, measure of economic performance, I have uh, inflation, GDP, and stock prices. So the idea here would be, you know, low inflation, high GDP, and rising stock prices would be all things that kind of cluster around a stronger U.S. economy. And then there's a, a kind of third option down below, other options, um, which we'll ignore for now and maybe come back to at some point. So if you look at this plot, 
there's just a basic least squares regression line going through some points. And these points are basically the relationship between uh, more power for Democrats. So as you go to the right, uh, those would be times when there were more Democrats in office. And as you go up, you get a better economy. So uh, lower inflation, higher GDP and uh, rising stock prices. So we look at the relationship and you can see uh, number four all the way to the right of this web page. Um, we have a p-value that's just above the 5% threshold. So you can see that the line has a very slight upward slope, but the p-value for this regression, this, this would be um, the t-test for this predictor or equivalently the f-test, uh, doesn't show a statistically significant relationship. And, you know, some social scientists might stop here and say, yeah, I haven't found a relationship that I'm looking for. Uh, but others might think, well, you know, I really have this hunch that Democrats uh, are better for the economy. Let me try to manipulate this a little bit and include different data and see what happens. So you could start to include maybe not just the House of Representatives, but also senators. And you'll notice that ah, the data seems to be even more uh, cloudy. I get a higher p-value. Oh, let me check governors. Okay, if there are more uh, governors, I get closer, but not quite below the threshold. Uh, presidents, including presidents, doesn't work. Maybe I'll take out senators. Uh, okay, if I take out senators, now I have a statistically significant relationship. Let me write up a paper and uh, publish this paper to suggest that I found this relationship. You know, Democrats are, are good for the economy. Now, that is uh, not the way that frequentist inference is supposed to work. Uh, you're supposed to operationalize your variables first and then choose a sample size, in this case, the various years um, that you'll be comparing, and then look for statistical significance and a strong relationship. But here we've kind of done it backwards. We've kind of just chosen something to see what happens and then played with the results until we get something that, you know, quote unquote, we want to see. Of course, you can do this with Republicans too. And in fact, if you just switch from Republicans to Democrats with these same variables, you'll see a statistically significant relationship in the other direction. This shows uh, more Republican power uh, slightly uh, weaker economy. But of course, if you maybe mess around with some of these variables, you could probably find uh, a slope that's uh, going in the other direction. I haven't done this before. Yeah, there's one. So governors and senators, for some reason, you might pick those two. Um, and the employment rate, and here we get a very small p-value and, you know, a slope that looks somewhat significant, although there's lots of variability here. And so, again, if you were a social scientist, maybe um, you were a bit naive or you had uh, reasons to be a bit deceptive because you were very strongly partisan, you might choose these variables to operationalize uh, your research question and then publish the results suggesting that Republicans are better for the economy. And all this to say, uh, frequentist inference allows for these researcher degrees of freedom. And those researcher degrees of freedom kind of allow you to get, you know, almost any result that you'd like with enough uh, creativity in how you define things. And just to sort of go back to this objection more squarely, this kind of activity suggests that uh, if there's something not quite right with frequentist inference, even if the methods themselves are sound, the way that they can be misused is, uh, is problematic and maybe we should explore other methods.